All right, great. Well, thanks for having me for the second time now at Quirk Astronomy Club. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Michael Trummel. I'm a lecturer at UCC, started back in January, <clears throat> so I'm relatively new still. Um, last time I was here, I talked about something more related to my direct research, which is simulations of galaxies. So I study the formation and evolution of galaxies using primarily computer simulations run on large computers all across the world. Uh, but today, uh, well, because I have to talk about something different, uh, but I want to talk about something very timely, which are the, the new observations that have been happening for the last year. So 2023 has been a really monumental year for extragalactic research, among other things, uh, thanks to observations like the one I'm showing right there uh, from JWST, uh, the new space telescope uh, that I think was already mentioned uh, just a second ago. Uh, this is getting really brand new data, and as I'll, as I'll tell you about, some really exciting new and surprising information about what the early universe looks like. So uh, the focus of this talk will be mostly on that, as well as some other ways that in the coming decade or so, we'll be able to look at things like galaxies and my personal favorite thing, massive black holes in the very early universe. Um, so I'm going to get started actually with something I showed last time I was here. This is a really nice movie of many of the galaxies that we have observed in the local universe, so relatively close to us. I use the term relatively, uh, that's just doing a lot of work there. These galaxies are very far away, uh, but they still are kind of within the, the local universe, if you will. So this is data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So each of these galaxies is a real picture of a galaxy. It's just placed in space based on their three-dimensional position that we can measure, right? We know their distance, we know their location on the sky, and so we know their three-dimensional position. Uh, so we're kind of flying through the universe if we could do that uh, in real life. Each of those images is one that's actually been taken by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. Uh, and the, the reason I'm showing this again is that this really exemplifies what we're trying to do in astrophysics research for galaxies, right? We have all these galaxies all over the, the, you know, all over the place in different environments. You might notice that there's this kind of cosmic web structure to this. The galaxies aren't evenly distributed. They kind of exist along filaments and nodes. Uh, some galaxies are more lonely. Some galaxies have a lot of other galaxies around them. And they all look different. They have different colors, different shapes, different masses. And so our goal as astrophysicists is to understand why do galaxies look the way they do? How do they get to be the way that they are? What internal and external processes played a role in making those galaxies look the way they do? What, what physics is going on in, in how galaxies evolve? Um, and so I wanted to start with a, a brief kind of history of the universe, if you will. We'll be talking about the very early universe, so I think this is particularly important uh, for this talk. So uh, the basics of kind of Big Bang cosmology, right, is the universe is about 14 billion years old, 13.8 uh, to be a bit more precise. Uh, and at the beginning, there was this Big Bang. Uh, the universe expanded very rapidly. Um, and a lot of important chemistry and physics happened in the very early universe that unfortunately we can't really see. We can do the math. Uh, we can, we can, based on what we know exists today, we can, we can be confident that we kind of get the physics right. Uh, but the first point in the universe that we can actually see what's going on comes right about here during this epoch called recombination. So in the very early universe, the universe was very dense, it was very hot, and all it was was a bunch of particles and photons in a soup, if you will. Things were so hot that you basically had protons and electrons just freely flying all over the place. Uh, and you had photons essentially interacting with them. So quantum mechanically, a photon can spontaneously become a positron and uh, uh, 
electron, and then those positrons and electrons annihilate and create a photon again. And so all these things were happening. Photons were interacting with matter in this kind of big old soup of stuff. Uh, but then finally, as the universe continued to expand, right, for, for those that, you know, maybe had some basic thermodynamics, you take a gas and you allow it to expand, it'll cool off. And so the universe cooled off over time, and eventually all those particles came together and formed atoms. And uh, during a process, during a time called recombination, right, the, the atoms began to, the matter decoupled from the photons. So the photons, which were trapped in this soup of hot particles, uh, were suddenly allowed to be free and stream away and fly away. And they make it to us here on Earth today. All around us is the cosmic microwave background represented by the very early phase in the universe. So I also showed this last time. Uh, hopefully not too many of you were here last time, otherwise this would feel like a rerun so far. Uh, but this is a really cool observational discovery. This is the earliest point in time of the universe that, can we, that we can really see. Uh, it's essentially a map of the temperature of the universe at this, very, at this time, what we call the time of last scattering, that time when photons were finally able to be free of their, their proton and electron soup uh, and scatter away and reach us here on Earth. Uh, we observe this in the microwave, so you need like big radio dishes to see them. Uh, I might have said this last time, but uh, the, the, my, my favorite fact about the cosmic microwave background is that the people that observed it originally, uh, they weren't trying to observe it. They actually thought it might be like some kind of noise. At some point, they thought it might be bird poop on the, on the actual detector, uh, but it was actually one of the greatest discoveries that we've ever had, which is, again, the universe as it was before there were any stars or any galaxies. The universe was just a, a gas, basically, a, a bunch of stuff all together with slightly different temperatures, right? And these slightly different temperatures, these red and blue dots, represent regions that are just a bit hotter and just a bit colder by like a very, very small amount, like a fraction of a fraction of a percent hotter and colder. But these small inconsistencies in temperature betray small little over densities or under densities, regions that are just a bit denser than others. And then eventually gravity does its work and those dense regions begin to collapse and grow and become <laughs> denser and denser and denser and eventually interesting things start to happen. But that takes a while. So after the cosmic microwave background, the universe kind of enters into this dark ages, right? The light <clears throat> that was you know, streaming away is streamed away and it gets to us on Earth, but then we don't really see anything happening. We don't really know what goes on in this kind of dark ages period until as that, that dense gas and, the, and dense dark matter in the universe begin to gravitationally collapse, eventually you form the first stars in the first galaxies, and now you have new sources of light. Stars begin, nuclear fusion begin to emit light and, and condense into galaxies of stars, large groupings of stars, and then those galaxies evolve and cluster over time to be the galaxies that we're used to today, including our own galaxy. And so the universe started out as this hot, dense ball of stuff, and eventually that turned into galaxies, stars, planets, all of that. And so a large part of our goal, and, and indeed the focus of what I want to talk about today, is how far back can we actually see into this earliest phases of the universe? And first of all, why do we want to? And as we are, what are we learning about the universe at this time after this cosmic microwave background uh, happened as we're trying to peer further and further back to get to these first stars and first galaxies. Um, so I wanted to start with a bit of, you know, because I'll be focusing a lot of this talk on things in space, I wanted to point out that uh, there is a long history of ground-based astronomy. Of course, I don't really have to, to say to the people here, uh, but, you know, a lot of really important discoveries, including the expansion of the universe by Hubble, uh, happened from relatively small ground-based telescopes. In fact, at one point, one of the biggest telescopes in the world was here in Ireland, the Leviathan Telescope at Burke Castle, uh, where these two guys made a lot of really important discoveries, a huge catalog of objects, uh, Herschel and Messier, and uh, things like this, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, that is an image as it was detected from the Leviathan Telescope uh, all those years ago. So, so 
Telescopes have been really important on the ground, and they continue to be important ways of studying galaxies in particular from the ground. Right? A lot of the observatories that we use today are ground-based observatories. Even the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, all those galaxies that I showed in that movie at the beginning, those were detected on the ground in New Mexico. That's actually one of the few observatories I've actually been to was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But there's a lot of really big, really important telescopes on the ground. And indeed, we're still building telescopes on the ground. Uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, the extremely large telescope, we're getting a little bit bland with our naming now. Uh, these are being built as we speak to come online in the coming years, and they're gonna do great science. So one thing Vera Rubin is gonna do is essentially the next generation Sloan Digital Sky Survey called LSST, uh, which now that I'm thinking of it, I can't remember what that's supposed to stand for because it used to go by a different name before it was called Vera Rubin. Uh, but anyway, uh, these are things that will make brand new discoveries and, and be really great. But ground-based observatories are inherently limited, right, because as maybe I probably, again, don't really have to spend much time convincing you of, uh, is that the atmosphere gets in your way, right? The atmosphere absorbs light in a lot of important wavelengths, right? Obviously, it lets optical light through. That's why we can see a lot of the stars with our own eyes. That's why we evolved to see optical light wavelengths. Uh, and it lets long wavelengths like radio through. Uh, but it blocks a lot of really important light as well. So infrared light, which is also lower energy than optical, is absorbed by water in the atmosphere. Gamma rays and x-rays, thank goodness for us, are, observed, are absorbed by oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere. And ultraviolet light, which is actually really important for, for a lot of astrophysics as well, is absorbed by, by the ozone layer, in O3, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and so some light we just can't see from the ground. But even the light that we can see from the ground is affected by the atmosphere. And this little cartoon uh, I like shows what goes on as light from a single source fl flows through the atmosphere. And as it interacts with all the particles in the atmosphere, it gets scattered around. And so if you were to try to make an observation of an object, you'd get this scattering effect that essentially affects how good of a resolution you can really get by observing something through the atmosphere. Right. As a great example of this, we can compare what it's like observing a galaxy from the ground back in 1994 versus observing that same galaxy with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, nine years later. Right. You get a ton more resolution because you're not affected by uh, the atmosphere in that way. That's also why a lot of telescopes are high up in the mountains. You have less atmosphere to do this scattering. You also have things like adaptive optics to try to account for this, to make this effect less. Uh, but you really just can't beat going into space to really increase your resolution. And so this was the main driver but of, essentially since we launched Hubble in the early 90s, of a whole large generation of space telescopes. Right? This is just a, a few of them. There's actually more that I was too lazy to put on this slide. Uh, but we, we have space telescopes that we've been launching since the early 90s that observe a whole bunch of different wavelengths. So a lot of these, you might notice are wavelengths that are affected by the atmosphere. So X-ray telescopes, uh, gamma rays, or the Fermi telescope, uh, infrared lights. Uh, but even though we have optical telescopes as well, and Hubble does a lot of observing in the optical too, again, just because you get out of the atmosphere, you could get a lot more detailed images. But another thing you can do, if you're not limited by being on the surface of the Earth, is you can essentially point your telescope at one spot for as long as you want, more or less. That's not 100% true for all space telescopes, but you're a lot more free as to when you can observe because you don't have the sun getting in the way as much, right? And so we can do things like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This and the other Hubble Deep Fields, this actually isn't the first one, but the first Hubble Deep Field was essentially uh, you know, I wonder what happens if we point the Hubble Space Telescope at one spot in the sky that doesn't seem to have anything in it. There's no, nothing there. Let's just point it there and leave it there for a long time. And as you leave your telescope in the same spot, just collecting light and photons just constantly, you end up seeing that even in what looked like a dark spot, there's a whole bunch of galaxies, right? And the reason I bring this up 
is because a lot of the galaxies in this picture we didn't know existed before Hubble because they're very dim. And they're dim not because they're small, but because they're very far away, right? And so I want to point out the, the connection here between distance and time, uh, between the galaxies that we observe uh, in the universe. So as we get better at observing dim things, say like with Hubble, or as I'll say with JWST, these things are also very far away, right? And we can think of you know, us as an astronomer on the ground collecting light from these galaxies. But light has, of course, a speed limit, right? Light through a vacuum has a very specific speed. And so if we observe something that's far away, it's also taken that light a long time to reach us, right? When you look at Andromeda, and there's a nice image of Andromeda just a second ago, that light is millions of years old, OK? And that's the closest neighbor that we have. So with these galaxies, you're looking at light that's often billions of years old, OK? And so Hubble, with images like this, is not just seeing galaxies far, far away. It's also seeing galaxies from a long time ago. In fact, there's galaxies in this image that are billions, many, many billions of years old that actually come from when the universe was just a billion years old. So that would be about you know, 12, 13 billion years ago these little red dots in these images from Hubble. And so space telescopes have really opened up for a long time now, the early universe that simply wouldn't be possible from the ground because again, you just can't make this kind of detailed observation, long, high resolution observations of photons just staring in the same spot for a very long time. Right? But again, because distance and time are related in this, what we're really seeing are snapshots of galaxies at different times. And so uh, a big connection that I like to make is that astronomy is not so different from archaeology. If you think about people digging under the ground for things from the past, right? the deeper you go underground, the older things are, more or less, this idea of stratification. right? So similarly with galaxies, the further away we go, the older light that we're seeing. right? So the further the galaxy is, the earlier into the universe we're looking, right? And just like when we dig underground for, for fossils or for artifacts, as we dig deeper and deeper, it becomes harder and harder to see those things, right? Galaxies are further away. They're also smaller at earlier times, and so they're really difficult to detect in that sense. But just like as we dig under the ground, it might be harder and harder to find the artifacts we're looking for, uh, but also, there's a bigger difference between you know, what we know from the world around us and what we're going to see in the ground. We don't know necessarily what humans you know, many, many thousands or even millions of years ago were like. right? And so being able to, to identify these things becomes difficult. Just like with galaxies, galaxies 12, 13 billion years ago looked very different from galaxies that we're used to looking at uh, in the nearby universe. And so the question then becomes, how do we, how do we connect all these dots? Right? Because just like with archaeology, we, we can't watch human civilization evolve over time. All we have are clues and snapshots in time of a civilization, of people, or anything like that. Right? These are essentially pictures of individual galaxies in different places at different times. How do we actually connect that to, to understand how, how these galaxies are changing and evolving, what physics is going on. And so, I talked about this last time, but simulations play a big role in this. This is, again, what I do for, for a living, trying to simulate galaxies, because with simulations, we're able to follow galaxies through time and see how did what is a big galaxy today look like billions and billions of years ago, or alternatively, what did a small galaxy at, you know, when the universe was a billion years old, what does it grow up to look like? And what, what sort of things happen along the way to that galaxy? Right? And one thing that simulations have consistently been telling us for about three decades now is that galaxies form hierarchically, meaning that if I have a galaxy at late times it's pretty big, that galaxy grows up as a result of many smaller mergers. So you might have noticed from the movie, here, let me play it again, actually. So 
this movie starts off with not much going on. But then we see small little galaxies, small little points in light uh, with stars, and there's also some black holes there too. Those small little galaxies come together, they merge into bigger galaxies, and those bigger galaxies merge together to form bigger and bigger galaxies. And eventually you get something that looks like the galaxy you're used to, a spiral galaxy with a nice big disk and gas and stars and all that. But that large galaxy came from all these small little mergers. right? And so this idea of this merger tree, that as you go backward in time, the galaxy that you're looking at was really the result of many smaller galaxies as its descendants. Right? So the, the, the upshot here is that with observations, if you want to understand really where galaxies came from today, those, those, that big movie with all the SDSS galaxies, the challenge is, is that we really need to know about small galaxies very far away. If you want to know the origins of a large galaxy like the Milky Way, and we want to see those descendant galaxies or you know, proxies for those descendant galaxies, we need to see something that's both very far away in the early universe, but also small, right? Because the descendants of our galaxy, or the progenitors, I should say, of our galaxy were small little guys. <clears throat> and so this is why we need more and more powerful telescopes, because these tiny galaxies, far, far away, are very, very difficult to see. And so this is where, finally, I get to, to the, main, the main bulk of this, which is JWST. <clears throat> so uh, I... Sounds like maybe some of you already know quite a bit about JWST, but I uh, figured I'd give an overview, right? So it is a space telescope. It's not orbiting the Earth. It's orbiting the sun at the L2 point. So this is a point of uh, essentially an unstable equilibrium point uh, between uh, the, the Earth and the sun. So basically at L2, you're able to see you get an orbit that has the same period as the Earth's orbit around the sun because the satellite is feeling gravity from both the Earth and the sun working together to provide that centripetal acceleration around the sun. Uh, but because L2 isn't, uh, it's, it's, it's not a stable equilibrium point, uh, the satellite JWST actually makes these little orbits around L2 and indeed has to expend fuel to stay on that orbit for long term. Right? But this is a great orbit to be on because it's, it's always, you know, <clears throat> it's far away from the sun. It's always in the same place relative to Earth. And it puts it in a position where it can observe the same spot constantly. The sun is never getting in the way of JWST. Uh, and so it can do a lot of amazing things uh, that other telescopes have not uh, because of the nature of, of where it is in space. Um, again, we couldn't do this kind of thing, say, 30 years ago, um, but we can today, putting it out into the L2 Lagrange point. Uh, but beyond its location in space, orbiting the sun very far away from the Earth, uh, it's also just bigger. Right? This, is the combina this is the comparison between the Hubble mirror and the JWST mirror. So JWST and Hubble are often compared together as I'll show in a second, it's because they observe similar wavelengths of light. But JWST has a much, much bigger mirror, which means more photon collecting power. So bigger telescope, easier to collect photons, and you get better resolution. Uh, so it's not too surprising that JWST is going to be able to make very impressive observations, even compared to something as, as awesome as Hubble has been for the last 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, the wavelength of light is similar to, but not the same as Hubble. So Hubble was really looking at the optical and the near infrared, maybe a little bit of, UV, of, of near ultraviolet in there. Okay, so optical plus a little bit higher wavelength and a little bit lower wavelength than optical, but really centered on optical light. <clears throat> the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is one of the ones I showed in that other one slide where I had a kind of a family portrait of all of them, uh, that observes in the far infrared. So you're looking at longer wavelengths, lower energy light. And James Webb is kind of in this middle ground, observing a really wide range of mostly near and mid infrared. Right? So lower energy light than optical. Um, and so it's, it's filling an important niche that we haven't really seen. But again, remember that infrared light is something you really need to go to space to really get detailed images of because of all the water in our atmosphere, which again, great for us, not so great for observing infrared. 
So what can we do with JWST? I'm sure a lot of you have seen a lot of the really cool images, but you know what, I'm gonna show you a bunch of really cool images anyway. Uh, so if we look at galaxies nearby, we can do a lot of really cool science. These are some really amazing images that JWST has taken of nearby galaxies. Uh, and so with infrared, you're looking at different things, right? That's why we want to get multi-wavelength pictures of galaxies. It's not just observing in the optical or the UV. You really want a full picture, get the whole spectrum of light. Each thing tells you something a bit different. Infrared light will give you information about dust, dust that's been heated up by stars and is now radiating thermally in the infrared. But you also get infrared light from stars, mostly giant stars. Right? These are stars with, with relatively cool uh, atmospheres that are big and massive and therefore cold and radiate more high wavelength light. Infrared light also nicely passes through dust. So these are new stars that we wouldn't have been able to see before because they've been blocked by the dust in these galaxies. And you also get my personal favorite thing, especially as you look at this bigger picture I have here, is these kind of, you can see that the, the, the distribution of dust isn't smooth. It's also not nicely in spiral arms. It's very chaotic. And you see these, these kind of bubbles popping. In. You can imagine if you were to watch a movie of this galaxy, you'd see these kind of bubbles appearing in the, in the dust. And this is a really important part of, of the internal physics of galaxies. These bubbles are being caused by newly born stars radiating light, pushing away gas and dust from, from their birthplaces, as well as supernova explosions pushing away that dust and creating shock waves through the gas. And so these processes are really important for understanding how stars form, and in particular, what limits star formation in galaxies. So people are spending a lot of time really studying these images, comparing with simulations, which I will say, matches really well with simulations. Uh, to learn more about the star formation process, where are stars being born, how are they affecting their nearby gas, all these little bubbles, the structures in the dust are really nice to study that. So looking at nearby galaxies in the infrared is adding more information to the internal structure of galaxies and the physical processes going on in there. But that's not really what I want to focus on. These are just cool images I wanted to show, but also like this is going to be like lead to really awesome science in understanding galaxies. But what JWST can also do is essentially the same thing that Hubble did, which is look at a point in space and just collect photons to do a really, really deep, what we would call a deep image. So if you stare at the same place, collecting more and more photons, you're, you're going to be sensitive to dimmer and dimmer things further and further away. So for that, let's see if this shows up well. I have a picture of one of the deep fields. Uh, from Hubble. So this is what Hubble took. A really, really important image from Hubble, actually, of a, of a galaxy cluster uh, that also includes a lot of stars very, very far away. You might be able to make out in this image that some galaxies look stretched and weird, and that's because of a process called gravitational lensing. So gravity is actually warping the light, bending the light from, gas, from galaxies behind some massive structure some galaxy cluster in the foreground, the light's bending around it, it's becoming distorted and also magnified, uh, which is really important. But if we look at the same thing with JWST, we see so much more detail. Everything looks brighter because JWST is gonna be much more sensitive. This was made with a small fraction of the time that it took Hubble to make that previous image. So again, it's all about that really big mirror on JWST able to collect photons much more efficiently, and you can get just an exquisite image of a lot of galaxies. And again, now we can really see some of these gravitationally lensed galaxies, uh, which are really, really interesting. Uh, because it turns out, right, gravitational lensing, like it implies, it's like, a, like your lens in your glasses, right? It, it magnifies things. So it does distort the galaxy, but it also magnifies it. So with a gravitational lens, you're able to see even further away things that even JWST might not be able to see. That's been magnified by gravity, uh, which is really cool as well. So JWST has been taking a lot of these deep field images where you try to get a lot of photons in a relatively small field of view, just collecting things and collecting as, and, and making you sensitive to these dim, very far away galaxies. So there's a couple examples here. And what, what it's often been doing is taking data on the same spots in the sky that Hubble and other space telescopes have been observing for a long time. 
right? And that's nice too, because we already have some data from these other telescopes at different wavelengths. And so now you get a much more detailed view at new wavelengths. And you can look at the same part of the sky, look at the same population of galaxies, plus all those other ones that you couldn't see before. Uh, and I wanted to point out, this is one a really cool example of a gravitational lens. So in this particular case on the right there is a gravitationally lensed galaxy. But this is very special because in this galaxy is a star, an individual star that was additionally gravitationally lensed by a, a cluster of stars in, within that galaxy or some, somewhere in the foreground. And so this is a case where JWST has actually been able to observe what we think is an individual star at very early times within a galaxy, which is super, super cool. So the, the amount of information that we're getting of galaxies further away from us than ever before is astounding. Again, with the size of the mirror, not only are you able to do this with shorter exposure times, right? that means you're more efficient, but then if you keep looking, you'll see even deeper. Right? We haven't even gotten there yet. This is just in the first year. JWST has only been taking data since early 2023. Right? The, some of the first science, well, I should, that's, that's kind of a lie. In, in mid-2022 was when some of the very, very initial data came out. But really, most of the science has been taking place in this year, in this calendar year, looking at things like this, uh, which, is, which is amazing. But one thing I want to point out here is another aspect of looking at galaxies far away that can also explain why the specific wavelength range that JWST is sensitive to is so important. <clears throat> so the universe is expanding. So if we go back to this picture of the humble astronomer observing a galaxy in the universe, all the galaxies that we look at, for the most part, especially as we look very far away from us, are moving away from us. This is because the universe as a whole, space-time itself, is expanding. And so on average, galaxies are moving away. And the further away those galaxies are, the faster they're moving away from us. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, if something is moving away from you and you observe light, the photons that you get from that object are Doppler shifted or red shifted. Right? What was originally higher energy light gets shifted to lower energies by the time it reaches us. Right? It's the same effect as, well, not exactly the same, but a very similar effect to when you hear like an ambulance or something driving by and the frequency changes depending on if that ambulance is coming towards you or moving away from you. Same thing is happening essentially with light. As things travel away from you, light gets red shifted. Right? So that means, right, <clears throat> that the, the original light is now at redder colors or lower energies, whichever way you want to think about it. And again, the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving, so the stronger this redshift effect becomes. Right? And so if you think about the specific case of looking at the very, very early universe, these very, very young galaxies when the universe was only a billion years old or less, right? that light has had to travel for a long time and a long distance in this expanding universe. And as that's happened, that light has shifted a lot in wavelengths. So what was originally optical and ultraviolet light at the time is now at these redshifts in the infrared, which is great because that's what JWST observes in. So specifically being sensitive to the, to the infrared is great for, for near field things. It's great for learning more about galaxies in the local universe, but it's also great for learning about galaxies at high redshift because optical and UV light, really great for, star, for young star populations in the early universe. And a lot of emis important emission lines take place at these wavelengths as well. So really well uh, positioned to, to make high redshift observations. And that's exactly what it's been doing. So JWST is already seen some of the earliest galaxies, earliest and smallest galaxies at that time that we've ever seen before. Here's just a few examples of that. Uh, so it's kind of hard to, to see, but there's some, the, the big image I showed before, there's a few cutouts of individual galaxies that look a bit like blobs. Uh, but JWST is armed with a spectrograph, which means you can take spectra of these galaxies. It can pinpoint different emission lines. In particular, hydrogen and oxygen are very useful in this case, and those are highlighted there. The blue is oxygen, the two red are two hydrogen emission lines. 
And we can use these lines to calculate the redshift of the galaxy because we know in the rest frame what these emission lines are, what wavelength they occur at. We can look at what wavelength we see them at with JWST, calculate the redshift, and if you know a little bit about the cosmological history of the universe, you can turn that redshift into an age of the universe. And so these are galaxies that are roughly between the top one is about 11.3 billion years old and the bottom one is 13.1 billion years old. Right? These are galaxies that are, are coming into the first billion years of the universe in some of these cases. And you notice those emission lines, they're shifting to the right. As we get to galaxies at higher redshift, those same emission lines are moving to the right, which is larger wavelengths, which is lower energies. So they're being redshifted. Right? And again, that relative distance from the original emission point tells us what redshift the galaxy is at. So if you hear someone talk about redshift, that's what they're talking about. They're essentially measuring the relative speed of the galaxy, but ever since the time of Edwin Hubble, we know that that also tells us something about the distance and also the age of that galaxy. <clears throat> and so this has been J one of the, the best things to come from JWST. Here's a few more examples of incredibly high redshift early galaxies. So 13.3 billion years old, 13.2 billion years old. Galaxies that existed within the first billion years of the universe we're now observing with JWST. This plot on the left shows the UV magnitude in the rest frame of galaxies as a function of the redshift that we observe them at. So again, smaller values of redshift are later in time, closer to today. Larger values of redshift are earlier in time when the universe was younger. And we're seeing things at earlier times than we've ever seen before at the same or even lower magnitudes than, uh, <clears throat> than, than, than some of the HST things that we've seen. So this has been, yeah, like a whole new world of the universe has opened up to us that was essentially only, you know, a few of the biggest, brightest, weirdest things we could see as some of these redshifts. But now we're seeing all sorts of galaxies, everyday galaxies, if you will. Not, not necessarily the special big ones only, but, but all sorts of different galaxies. The building blocks of bigger galaxies. So again, a critical component if you want to understand where galaxies come from. Right? This is their building blocks that we're seeing in the very early universe. And not only that, but because of the spectra that we can get of these galaxies, we're not just seeing galaxies. They're not just blobs we can actually look at the composition of gas in galaxies. All these different emission lines, while nice to uh, understand the redshift of the galaxies, are also useful for understanding the chemical composition of the gas and stars within those galaxies. So we're learning about the internal structure, the internal composition of these galaxies at early times, uh, not just the light, you know, not just their brightness, you know, uh, which has been, been really amazing. Um, and of course, with all of this, has come a lot of really interesting and important surprises. In the past year alone, there's been just a ton of scientific papers, and, and it seems like a new important discovery changing the way we think about the early universe has happened. So one of the bigger things that, that seem to be consistent throughout a lot of the early works is that there's a lot more galaxies than we thought there were at early times. So this plot on the left, is showing the number of galaxies that we'd expect between two different redshifts, between redshift 12 and uh, 16 at a given magnitude limit. Those blue bars represent predictions from different theoretical models, and the red line with the error bar is the JWST observations. Right? Significantly, in a statistical sense, significantly above all the predictions from theoretical models. Another way of thinking about this is on the right, this is essentially the, the number of galaxies per unit area you can think of as a function of redshift for a given uh, magnitude cut. So every galaxy with a magnitude below uh, 28.5, the gray lines represent the observations from JWST, and all those lines in the bottom there, in the bottom plot here, represent all of our theoretical models, all the simulations that people like me run. And the majority of them, way off, right? So JWST is predicting, not predicting, sorry, is observing many more galaxies than we ever thought there were in the early universe. So more galaxies than we thought, 
And it also turns out that they look different than we thought too. So if we look at the morphology of galaxies between what we saw with HST, with the Hubble Space Telescope, compared to what we see with JWST, now we're actually at a bit lower redshift, so not quite as extreme as the other ones, but still very interesting. What we're seeing with JWST, because now we can actually see the structures of galaxies and resolve <clears throat> you know, whether or not a galaxy is disk dominated or spheroidal dominated. What we're seeing is that while with HST, these black dots, we predicted that as we go back in time, there seemed to be less disk galaxies. What we thought was is that galaxies take some time to form a nice rotating disk. And it takes time to get all of that angular momentum that in the early times, you have a lot of mergers mixing things up and it's really difficult to have a stable, nice, coherent disk. But it turns out, now that we can see all these fine structure details with JWST, disk galaxies in the middle there are significantly more predominant than we thought they were at early times. So this means that galaxies are forming earlier, there's more of them at early times, and their structure is also forming earlier than we thought there were with JWST. And so these are two examples where as we get more detailed information at early times, we start to challenge all of our models that we, that we tuned and that we're proud of and explaining observations with, with older telescopes. Now that we have these new observations, our picture is changing. And as I'll, as I'll say, this, this presents you know, interesting, interesting challenges for, for simulations. But JWC doesn't just observe galaxies. It also observes my favorite type of object, which are very massive black holes. So in the center of one of these galaxies, as part of the Sears survey, <clears throat> a galaxy that's 13.2 billion years old. So about 600 million years after the Big Bang, in the center of this galaxy is a black hole that's about 9 million times the mass of our sun. For reference, the black hole in the center of our Milky Way is about half that mass. Sagittarius A star. So we know this black hole exists because of that spectra down there. Again, because JWST is able to take a spectra and is sensitive specifically to hydrogen emission lines, we're able to make this plot down here. Now, it may seem very subtle, but there's the white, which is the actual observation, and then there's two different fits on that plot. There's the purple line, which is a bit thinner and more pointed, and there's the yellow line, which has longer tails. Right, so that yellow line represents very, very rapidly rotating gas. Right, so what we're seeing is hot gas nearby the black hole rotating very rapidly in a strong gravitational field. And so not only does this betray the existence of a black hole, it also lets us measure its mass. Right, so we have a 9 million solar mass black hole when the universe was only about 570 million years old in this case which is amazing, right? But now I have to back up a little bit again because so far I've been talking about galaxies and now I'm getting onto black holes. So why do we care about these black holes in the first place? Well, these massive black holes, massive black holes being millions to billions of times the mass of our sun, supermassive black holes, they're sometimes called. Uh, I like to, Sometimes people have very specific opinions about what's supermassive and what's just normal massive, so I try to be more inclusive. Because uh, there are people, yeah, in my line of work, but, you know, oh, if it's 100,000, it's not supermassive, it's just massive. So I've been getting used to using the term massive instead. Uh, so these massive black holes are found in the centers of pretty much every massive galaxy, galaxies like the Milky Way. They're also seen in lots of small galaxies, too, dwarf galaxies, so they're pretty ubiquitous. They're typically found in the centers of galaxies, and we find them sometimes through kinematics. So similar to what we just saw with JWST, you can look at the motions of gas and stars in the very center of galaxies, and you can then say that there's some, some unseen mass, which is a black hole. Uh, but more commonly, especially at, at higher redshifts at earlier times, we see things like this, really bright points of light, which represent really, really luminous gas around a black hole, in particular a growing black hole. So black holes that are accreting mass at very high rates, that gas as it falls onto the black hole gets very hot uh, and emits a lot of often high energy light. 
Now, the reason we care about these black holes, beyond just the fact that we know they exist and that's pretty interesting and where the heck did they come from, is that actually they're really important for galaxies too. Right? We have this nice relationship, very famous relationship called the M-sigma relation, which relates the mass of these, these massive central black holes to the velocity dispersion of their host galaxy stars. But you can really think about that velocity dispersion as essentially smaller galaxies have smaller black holes and bigger galaxies have bigger black holes, which might not sound super exciting, but the fact that these black holes are individual objects that are less than 0.1% the mass of their host galaxies, despite being massive, they're still small compared to their host galaxies, and physically about the size of our solar system at most. So somehow the galaxy knows about these black holes and vice versa, that there's this relationship between the two, meaning that they somehow were evolving together, which the difference in scales in mass and in size is just astounding for that. And in fact, it goes even further than that. We can see things like these massive outflows from galaxies that are caused by these black holes. As they grow and accrete mass, they release energy into their surroundings, and that energy then gets transferred to gas around them, and they produce gigantic explosions and outflows of gas that can affect their entire galaxy. So what we think is happening is that the galaxies are affecting the growth of black holes, but also the growth of those black holes is affecting their galaxies, in particular, very massive galaxies, but really all galaxies. It's another physical process that's important in shaping what a galaxy looks like. So we really want to understand how this process happens. Where do these massive black holes come from? How do they grow? And how are they affecting their host galaxies? And so what it boils down to is, is this. If we think about that relationship between the mass of a black hole and the mass of its galaxy on the x-axis, we can think, all right, well, we, we know what this is like today. We're pretty good now at detecting these massive central black holes at galaxies nearby at the late universe, right? But the, the trick is we need to understand what they're like in the early universe to really understand this evolutionary history. And this is exactly where we're starting to get really nice information from JWST. We're only just now being able to really see a complete or nearing a complete picture of black holes in the early universe. And when I say that, it's not that we haven't seen black holes in the early universe before, but as I like to think of it, we we're, we're kind of have a biased sample. So what I'm plotting here is the mass of the black hole versus the age of the universe where we see the black hole. All right, so as we get to the right, the universe is getting older. The purple represents the black holes that we've seen with other telescopes. Now, on the right is 1.1 billion years old. That's actually still quite young. So we're still talking very early universe here. We've seen black holes in the early universe, but the ones we're seeing with JWST, three examples are shown here, are much smaller, and in this case, very early compared to other black holes that we've seen with other telescopes. That's because, right, with the limited sensitivity that other telescopes have, you're only really sensitive to the biggest black holes in the most biggest, in the biggest galaxies growing the fastest that are shining the most light from the gas around them, right? Because you're only able to see the brightest, biggest things in the universe when you don't have the detail of JWST. So I like to think of it like, you can't really study black holes like that. You can think of it like, if you try to do a demographic study of people and try to understand how, how people live their lives and where they came from and all that, but you only interviewed the richest 0.1% of the population. That wouldn't give you a sense of how typical people lived and, you know, and worked. But these black holes that we're seeing were essentially that 0.1%, the biggest black holes in the weirdest, most unique environments, which are important to understand and can place interesting constraints on our models but now we're starting to see the typical black holes. Just like we want to understand the building blocks of galaxies, now we're understanding the building blocks of black holes in the universe around us today. And so one, a couple interesting things that we're seeing from this is that early black holes seem to be quite large compared to their galaxy. Yes, we are observing black holes at smaller masses, but we're also observing them within smaller galaxies. So this is the plot of the black hole mass versus the mass of stars of the galaxy. All the yellow points are black holes that we've seen with JWST, and they're rather big compared to their galaxy. In some cases, they're almost 
or even higher, the mass of their galaxy. The, almost the majority of the galaxy is a black hole, which is not what we expected to find. Well, some people actually did predict it, uh, so I can't really say that. But this one here, in particular, this one, UZH1, is a black hole between 10 and 100 million times the mass of our sun in a galaxy that's about the same size. This is a black hole that's almost the same size as its galaxy. And this has actually been recently spectroscopically confirmed uh, to be at the redshift it's at. Uh, so we, we're pretty confident now that this is a really, really big black hole in a tiny galaxy. Uh, this has been recent observations where we pointed the Chandra Space Telescope and got X-ray data on this to see the light that the black hole is shining with that accretion disk around it at the same time, which is really cool. So this is, there's some, just like there's interest in galaxies, the galaxies don't look anything like we thought they would. The black hole population also is full of surprises. And again, the reason why it's so important to understand these early black holes is because now it, it begins to paint a picture of how black holes grow and evolve over time. In particular, where do these black holes come from in the first place? Right? So this is a nice example showing that. So this is using one of the recent uh, observations of one of these black holes at early times. This is a black hole around redshift. I think it's around redshift 10, right? Yeah, uh, nine-ish. Uh, we know the mass of the black hole at a given time, and we can think about okay, how do we get a black hole to grow that much in that short amount of time? And we can come up with different models, with different initial masses, with different growth physics, and some of those models don't work, like that dashed purple line. Some of the models work pretty good, but require a really big initial black hole. And some of them, like that, the steps there, require some really unique and strange physics. So we still don't know exactly for sure how these black holes grow, but as we get to observing them earlier and earlier on, we can begin to, to paint this picture of, of where these black holes came from. And the green points, again, just for comparison, are all the black holes we saw before JWST. So again, we're, we're going to earlier times and lower masses than we ever have before. Of course, JWST isn't the end. We have some other things on the way. Euclid, which I think was also just mentioned before I started talking here, is already beginning to take data. Soon, in the next year or two, we'll have the Roman Space Telescope, which will also be really great. So we're going to be getting additional telescopes with different strengths. So Roman, in particular, will have a wide field of view. So it's going to be able to do some really interesting, what we call wide field surveys. And so the combination of a wide field of view with the detail of JWST will be a really powerful combination to have. But, and I know I'm running low on time. Uh, I said I would be fine with 15 minutes, but... I want to talk real quick about additional observations that we can make. So with JWST and these other space telescopes, they're amazing, they're looking at light. But in the past decade, we've expanded how we can make observations. Gravitational waves have been observed by LIGO. These are gravitational waves that came from merging black holes, in this case, stellar mass black holes, black holes that are a few to tens of times the mass of our sun merging together. As those black holes merge and, and, and orbit around each other, they produce ripples in space-time that you can detect with something like LIS with LIGO. The, and that detection happens with you know, lasers and, and basically measuring the, the small little changes in space-time as those gravitational waves pass through the Earth. But the sim a similar thing happens with galaxies and black holes. When galaxies merge, and this is a simulation that I'm showing right now, when two galaxies merge, it's thought that they're, if they have massive black holes in their sensors, those black holes should also merge. And again, the same thing happens. They produce gravitational waves that we can detect. But we can't detect them with LIGO. We need something more fancy. So LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, will be a space version of LIGO. It'll be up in space, actually on a trailing orbit around the Earth. So this is what the orbit of, of LISA will look like. It'll trail around the Earth as it orbits the sun. Uh, and it'll be, have these really long laser arms. Basically, it'll be three separate telescopes connected by lasers measuring the distance that those lasers travel to see very small changes to space-time caused by these very big black holes. And the reason why this is so exciting for the early universe is that the black holes that Lisa will be sensitive to are really small, really early black holes. So this is 
representing the kind of the discovery space of Lisa, where you're looking at redshift, where you're going backwards as you go up, and the black hole mass, the masses of merging black holes that Lisa will be sensitive to. And it'll be really great for seeing black holes that are really small at really early times. And so for the first time, arguably even better than we'll ever be able to do with JWST, we'll be able to see the first black holes, uh, which is really exciting. And so I'm getting to the end. I've talked a lot about how these new telescopes are widening our view of galaxies and black holes. We're seeing things at earlier times and smaller masses than ever before. And this places really important uh, challenges to simulations. Right? Simulations are the way we really fully interpret and understand these observations. But simulations like this, cosmological simulations, which model whole volumes of the universe, and self-consistently track the evolution of individual galaxies, each with their unique environments and merger histories, you have a balance between how big, how many galaxies you simulate, your statistical sample, if you will, and your resolution. How small of a galaxy can you model? And this is where the challenge is, because what we're seeing with, with these telescopes is we want to see galaxies like this, but this is what a, a small galaxy at early times looks like in even the best simulations today. And so what we really need to do is push the limits in resolution and go to higher resolution simulations. Uh, and that's the challenge, because we need to now simulate big pieces of the universe at very high resolution in order to keep up with these observations. And this is kind of pictorially shown in this plot that I made, comparing some observational data to simulations. So this is the rate at which galaxies are forming stars as a function of their mass. The black points are JWST. Those open points, the small points on the upper right, are where we had with Hubble, right? So Hubble was great, but it, it stopped at pretty high mass. JWST is pushing down to much lower masses, and those lines all represent resolution limits of modern simulations. So JWST is now pushing towards even the highest modern simulation resolution limits, so we need to go further and go into to higher resolution to be able to resolve smaller galaxies to fully interpret these observations. So I'll leave you with this nice movie of one of these high-resolution simulations that, that I've been working on, and I'll take your questions. Sorry for going a bit long, um, but thanks for, thanks for hearing me talk. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to turn the lights on. So you, you can see Michael, and then you can... There we are. Bombard Michael with questions. Who's going to ask first? Well, first they have to wake up. Give them a second. So that's a good question. We, we still don't know a lot about how black holes grow. So kind of going back to this uh, kind of cartoon picture I showed, it's likely that black holes go through different phases where they're able to grow kind of more rapidly than the galaxy for a while, and then they kind of slow down, and then kind of grow back up again. So it's not necessarily that they grow at the same rate constantly. They kind of become limited at some stage. One thing that can limit the growth of black holes, keep them from kind of just continuing onward to grow arbitrarily, is the same thing that limits star formation. We saw in those images those bubbles of gas from stars exploding and all that. That same stuff, especially at early times in these small galaxies, can begin to shut off the gas supply available to black holes. So what you might have, and again, we still don't know, but one possibility is you have a galaxy just beginning to form its first stars with a black hole already in its center. And during those initial phases, the black hole is able to grow and grow and grow. But at some point, enough stars have formed that now you get these, you get sort of a competition between how fat, uh, the gravitational pull of the black hole and the, the exploding supernova happening all around it, messing up the gas. Uh, we already have a good idea from simulations that supernova can limit black hole growth. So it's likely it's probably happening in there. But it's complicated. We, we, we weren't necessarily expecting these overmassive black holes. And so it kind of is growing a wrench a little bit, to be honest with you, in, uh, in our understandings. Yeah. 
That's a really good question. So it all comes, it comes down to the, the shape of this emission line. So when you have gas just within the galaxy, it's, it's emitting at a certain temperature to, to, you know, when gas is emitting light, it emits light at a specific wavelength. But then just like the galaxy's light gets Doppler shifted if it's moving towards you or away from you, the gas is moving within the galaxy. And so you get some intrinsic width of the emission line based on the internal physics of the galaxy, based on how gas is moving, the temperature of the gas in the galaxy, which there's, there's, there's independent ways to, to account for that. Uh, but the fact that this line is not only, so if, if, the, gas, if the, the emission was only coming from gas spread out within the galaxy, what you'd see is that this would be able to be fit by just a single of these profiles with the same type of shape, with just a different width. Uh, but what we find is that you can't, the best fit for the shape of this emission line is this yellow line plus the purple line. So the fact that you need that yellow line in there, which is very wide, means that there needs to be a component of the gas that's moving incredibly fast. And the, the only way we know that, that we can get that is a telltale sign of gas in the center nearby a black hole. Um, this is not the, you know, we, this isn't the first time we've detected black holes in this way, so we have good machinery for kind of picking out these things, but that's where that comes from, the shape of this line, the fact that you need multiple different uh, profiles on top of each other to really fit the data. That's where that comes down to. And again, the way this works is you, you try to fit one, you, you kind of you grade it based on how good it does, and then you try to fit two, and if two does better than one, you're like, okay, I believe that it's two. That's, again, it's not without errors, but that's essentially what, what goes on. That's a really good question. So you're, you're wondering why, why is dark matter affecting where gas is? It all comes down to gravity. Uh, so most of the universe by mass is dark matter. And so that's the thing that's really determining the gravitational field. And so if dark matter is collapsing into structures. It's going to pull with it the gas. That's, that's, that's really what it is. But you actually bring up a very important point that the details of that actually do matter. How, how similar or different the kind of initial velocities of gas and dark matter are, do have imprints on the nature of gas in early times, and people do use that to, to study the nature of dark matter and some of the more detailed physics of, of, around that. So, so it does matter how that process plays out, but it essentially is just as simple as, as gravity pulls stuff in. Mike, did I have a comment with one of my, one of my own now? <clears throat> This relationship between black holes and galaxies. I can remember the time where I think I can, maybe 20 years ago, maybe even more recent than that, when astronomers were just beginning to perceive that some galaxies have black holes in them. And now it would appear that every galaxy, or nearly every galaxy, has a black hole. Yeah. But I think I understood you to say that you still don't know why. Did I got that right? Yeah, yeah. We have a pretty good idea that black holes exist. We've gotten better at, at seeing their lights and studying the detailed dynamics of gas. That's why we're now pretty sure they exist. But yeah, back in the day, I would say probably as, as recently as the early 90s, I think. Uh, there was still a lot of debate about whether or not the weird 
emission coming from the centers of galaxies and what that was all about. Uh, and, and finally, over time, it became clear that these were accreting black holes causing these emission lines. But that was actually a, a relatively recent thing, like within the last 30 to 40 years that we really became pretty solid on. Um, but yeah, we, we still don't know where they come from. There's lots of theories. Well, not lots, but there's a few theories. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of where plots like this are so important. As we see galaxy, as we see black holes earlier and earlier on, it places more strain on these different models of the initial mass, the, the accretion physics, which predicts different kind of maximal growth rates that a black hole can have. Uh, and so as we get to detecting these black holes earlier and earlier, maybe with JWST, but probably with gravitational waves, that's when we really start to see, really zero in on how these black holes came about, what were their original masses, and what physics could have caused them to form in the first place. But yeah, it's still very much up in the air because we can't see them yet. But, but just to pursue this relationship between the galaxy and the black hole, yeah. I'm right in thinking the black holes always sit in the center of the galaxy. Uh, are they, or are there some floating around in a random way? Oh, it's like I paid you to ask that question. So, <laughs> I, a lot of my work has also been on the dynamics of black holes, and, and uh, a good number of people now, including myself and others, are trying to understand black holes that aren't in the center of galaxies. So there actually have been observations of black holes that are off-center. Those are, are pretty much only detected through uh, AGN, so active galactic nuclei. So when the black hole is actually bright, or I should say the gas around the black hole is bright, and the black hole happens to be away from the center of the galaxy, those exist. Probably they, they're one of two things. Either there was a recent merger, and the black hole's kind of making its way to the center, or people like me argue that a lot of these black holes could be kind of destined to always be away from the center that you get if, if massive galaxies and small galaxies have black holes, when you get you know, two massive galaxies merging together, you might get something that looks like this, where the black holes eventually find each other and everyone's happy. Uh, but when you have very unequal mass galaxies, you can get the smaller galaxy being torn apart gravitationally by the bigger galaxy. And when that happens, you're left with a black hole that can be in a very wide and lonely orbit without a galaxy around it. And that's the case, if that's the case, it, it would take many, many times the age of the universe for that black hole to finally meet in the center. And so there could be some that are kind of trapped on these very wide orbits. That's what we predict from simulations. And there's been some observational evidence that that's true as well uh, from these, again, off nuclear, we say, away from the center sources of, of, of light that seem to only have, seem to only be able to come from, from massive black holes. Now, I review is my position by asking two questions. <laughs> um, I did see a few kind of tentative hands that were almost raised. Someone who was thinking of asking a question, not quite. Can I ask you, are there any simulations being done about what might happen to all these galaxies way into the future? <sighs> That's a good question. Uh, I would say not really. Uh, if only because the simulations are very expensive. <laughs> to get even to redshift zero, which is today. Uh, and the, yeah, the question is how much value is there in making a prediction that will never be able to be realized? Uh, because the only, the, so the time scale where sort of evolution of galaxies matter is like hundreds of millions of years. And so you could do that, uh, but it can never be tested against observations in, in anyone's lifetime. And, Hopefully humans are still around in 100 million years, but like, not really looking too great, to be honest with you. Uh, so, yeah, um, it becomes a bit tricky. Uh, yeah, so that, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's so interesting to watch what happens from the beginning, and you just wonder where it falls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Have you found some galaxy? Well, then this definitely will be the last question. Have you shown the answer of this? Have you discovered uh, galaxies that don't have black holes? Either? Have you observed galaxies that don't have black holes? I would say you observe galaxies where the, the most we can say is uh, the up, upper limit of the black hole mass. So we have observed galaxies that we don't see any evidence for a black hole. That doesn't mean it's not there, but if it's very close, we can do some pretty good studies at the very inner parts, and we can say, all right, there's no black hole, 
more massive than this in here. Um, but the problem is, if you, if you think about the galaxy as a whole, it's very difficult to even say that there's no black holes anywhere in the galaxy. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say it's hard to, it's always hard to say, to falsify completely everything. All you can say is that there's definitely not something that's bigger than this here. That makes sense. <coughs> Roger, okay, I'm going to have to control